All right, <clears throat> pardon me. And pardon the hoarseness sometimes. Good afternoon, here we are. Uh, gathered for seminar 15. Philokalia, the third century on various texts by Maximus, or the text of Maximus rather. And <clears throat> there's a, this is, one can remark this each time with full honesty. There's a lot here and, and, and it's beautiful and it's full of, full of life and light. My own through line through it that, that I want to just walk carefully here has to do something, the, the theme is something like appropriate form and, and truth and drawing near. The movement of drawing near is central in this passage, truth or being drawn near. Truth becomes complicated and wonderfully um, um, textured. And then appropriate form, the whole idea that there is a, a kind of authentic or inauthentic way to do something. And that depends on whether it's acting out of the reality in front of us or out of our own reality. And when we invent the form, it becomes inappropriate because it's our own invention. But an appropriate form arises from the, either the event or the constellation. Uh, just quickly through, uh, to signal the, the, the aphorisms that, that, that I wanna walk through and then we'll do as we please. The first is aphorism five, which is about sensible and um, noetic realities. Aphorism five sensible and noetic realities, <clears throat> or aesthetic and apophatic, aesthetic and apophatic. I think they're linked, sensible, aesthetic, noetic, apophatic. And then 10, which is about the wrath of God, and what that means, aphorism 10. And then <clears throat> aphorism 12, which is how, it's akin to, to something we, we saw last time, which was confu the confu confusing the movements of good and evil, confusing good for evil. And we're introduced into a wonderful word, <clears throat> conceit. So conceit becomes important in aphorism 12. And then <clears throat> uh, aphorism 15, which is about aspiration and limits. And then I want to offer a kind of thought of virtue as aphorism, to consider virtue as an aphorism or as aphorism. And then <clears throat> passages uh, 29 through 32. And this is about the divine drawing near, the divine drawing near. We're introduced to some remarkable imagery here, as well as metaphors. And, 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 and really truth is deepened here as well. So sections uh, 29 through 32. And then 36, 36, which is the action of grace and wisdom and theosis. Wisdom is another one of the key terms which Maximus really deepens for us here. But 36 is the action of grace and then wisdom and theosis. 37, <clears throat> is about what Maximus calls real faith or a good conscience. Real faith or a good conscience. That's 37. And then 40. This is, um, this is beautiful. This is about the truth which resides in all things. That's Maximus's line. The truth which resides in all things. Or we might say, drawing near from afar to what is yet close to us. This is the, 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 the most interesting, oh, it's a fascinating look at, at, at drawing near and, and, and what is close or nearby. That's 40. <clears throat> and then 46, which is about Christ's renewal of the whole of nature. Christ's renewal of the whole of nature. 46, <clears throat> the renewal of the whole of nature by Christ. And then 54 and 55 these contain remarkable statements about about the unoriginate kingdom and its manifestation or its image for us the unoriginate kingdom it's considered in two ways in in these passages 54 and 55 and then <clears throat> 57 
57, which is an account of, of, of the movement of evil and, and, and of evil and goodness. Evil and goodness. Maximus says some beautiful things. <clears throat> and then that's 57. And then 60 to 61. And this is wisdom. It's about wisdom. 60 to 61. Maximus says something wonderful. It just takes us through an idea. <clears throat> And then finally, 94, which is about personhood, personhood. Maximus contrasts a couple of emphases about personhood, what it means to be a person, which I think is salutary for us. Okay. Okay. So five, first of all, five, turn with me to five, please. <clears throat> And I don't have a lot to say for all of these. It, 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 they, they might be more just signposts to, to, to walk us to some ground on which we can stand. But there's a little bit of, little bit of something everywhere. Number five, sensible and noetic realities lie between God and man, or as I'm calling them, aesthetic and apophatic. Realities lie between God and man, God and the human person. When the human intellect, the noose, moves towards God, it transcends them, it transcends them, provided that it is not enslaved to sensible realities through outward activity and is not dominated in any way by the noetic realities it beholds during contemplation. So I just want to pause here on, on the level of almost definition. The noose, or the intellect, belongs with God, belongs with God beyond sensible and noetic realities that are available to us or apprehensible. The sensible here seems to be, um, as I said, aesthetic, but our created, our formed condition, the sensible. And the noetic or the apophatic is not a condition, but it's more of a movement. It's more the, the, ascetic, the ascetic movement of the noose right? The noetic, the apophatic is movement, or as I have tried to understand it, the, the gathering, integrating, and offering of our own beautiful, sensible existence to God. The noetic offers the sensible to God, as it were. God is beyond both the sensible and the noetic, and the noose belongs with God. Okay. Now, <clears throat> look at um, look at ten, just down the, the the end of the page. The wrath of God <clears throat> is the suspension of gifts of grace, a most salutary experience for every self-inflated intellect that boasts of the blessings bestowed by God, as if they were its own achievements. All right, the wrath of God is the suspension of the gifts of grace, a most salutary experience for every self-inflated self intellect that boasts of the blessing bestowed by God as if they were its own achievements. So referring back to five, the suspension of the gifts of grace by which we understand the wrath of God, that's what Maximus is saying, not angry activity, just suspension. But that means, <clears throat> oh, sorry, that occurs for self-inflated intellects that boast of the blessings bestowed by God as if they were their own achievements, i.e., referring back to five, the wrath of God comes upon them that forget that it is God is beyond both the sensible and the noetic, beyond our own offering. When we think that we are doing the offering through the noetic, we're giving ourselves, it's about us, you know, I can do it. Huh. grace seems to be withdrawn and we are left to our own devices, right? So wrath indicates noetic inertia on our part. And if our noetic, our apophatic efforts are what gather and offer our sensible, our aesthetic life to God, noetic inertia means sensible idolatry. It means remaining enthralled to the senses. We're not moving beyond them, even if we think we are. 
every self-inflated intellect that boasts of the blessings bestowed by God as if they were its own achievements. This is a cessation of struggle. This is when we become self-inflated, self-satisfied. We think we have it. I've achieved this. I don't need God. There's no more movements, right? Self-assured and self-focused. The wrath, <clears throat> the imagery of wrath is because we realize if God grants us this mercy, that this self-inflation, self-satisfaction, self-assurance tastes of hell. It goes nowhere. It's circular, right? It's not an offering, truly. It's not the movement beyond the sensible noetic to the divine. It's just circular. It's us. <clears throat> so with that in mind, turn to 12 now. Turn to 12 now. And what I want to draw out of here is the idea that the fruits of the spirit do not taste of hell. Although in appearance, the fruits of the spirit may seem similar to our own efforts, the results of our own efforts. We may think we've brought about joy. We may think we've brought about forgiveness or peace, right? According it to us. The distinction is the fruits of the spirit produce thankfulness and joy, and the latter, our own efforts, produce forgetfulness and pleasure. Pleasure, as David defined it a few weeks ago, the inward turned unjoyful movement of desire. All right, so this is 12. Providence has implanted a divine standard or law in created beings, and in accordance with this law, when we are ungrateful, and that's the word, ungrateful for spiritual uh, blessings, we are schooled in gratitude by adversity and brought to recognize through this experience that all such blessings are not our own, are not our own, but are produced through the workings of divine power. This is to prevent us from becoming irrepressibly conceited, from thinking in our arrogance that we possess virtue and spiritual knowledge by nature, by our own efforts and not by grace, no synergy there. If we did this, we would be using what is good to produce what is evil. The very things that should establish knowledge of God unshaken within us, instead, sorry, will instead be making us ignorant of him. The spiritual fruits look the same often, but one tastes of hell. Our own taste of hell because it's not true, and the grace field does not a taste of life. That's <clears throat> that's one thing I want to bring up. And then the word conceited in the middle, irrepressibly conceited. And I thought, ah, perfect. What a perfect, perfect word. A conceit in 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 literature or, or in, in 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 the fine arts is a kind of fanciful idea or image that brings about brings about a, a connection or a relation, right? But to be conceited is to imagine that the images we produce, our own images, are all, right? Our self-image, the image of ourselves, which we relay, we lie onto the world, is all. That, that's, what, that's what conceit means here, I would say. In other words, we mistake exactly what Christ said, which is we are in the images of God, <laughs> By saying, oh, no, I know I am in the image of God, right? I'm grasping the tree of life myself. This is me doing it. Right? <clears throat> and then 15. 15 is just over the page at the top of 213. He who has perceived how limitless virtue is never ceases from pursuing it. So as not to be deprived of the origin and consummation of virtue, namely God, by confining his aspiration to himself. For by wrongly supposing that he had achieved perfection, he would forfeit true being, towards which every diligent person strives. He who has perceived how limitless virtue is, is, never ceases from pursuing it, so as not to be deprived of the origin and consummation of virtue, namely God, by confining his aspiration to himself. For by wrongly supposing that he had achieved perfection, he would forfeit true being 
towards which every diligent person strives. If virtue is limit, limitless and our aspiration then, <clears throat> um, or virtue indicates something lim lim limitless and our aspiration is towards that, that means that we have an aspiration beyond horizon, an aspiration beyond horizon, beyond limit for God. Right? Since God is the, as Maximus says, the origin and the consummation of virtue. So an aspiration beyond horizon for God. Maybe, this might be tentative, maybe we could think of virtue as a kind of aphorism of God. Remember, aphorism means that which is gathered from within the sensible horizon, the, the uh, let's say, intelligible horizon. All right? Maybe virtues, virtues are those, those that aphorism, that, 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 that articulation of God, which is gathered from the horizon, but not standing in for it, right? To me, that's a, that's a neat way of, of, of renewing the idea of virtue and allowing it some place. It's kind of like an articulation of something beyond. <clears throat> Here then, conceit, we can bring conceit back into it. Conceit would be our aspiration confined, right? Confining his aspiration to himself. We lose God by conf confining our aspiration to ourself. Well, we lose the true image of life when we think that our image of, of life stands in for it. And asperism confined means we're just re-breathing one's own air again and again. It's a, it's a stuffy room. There's no breath. There's no breath of the spirit, there's no movement. There's a, stuff, a spiritual stuffiness to being conceited, right? <clears throat> True being in the last line, we can come back to this, and I would like, to, uh, I would like you, others to come back to it. Th the best I could figure for this term here, true being, would be something like, true being indicates our common fonts, our common fonts, and our desired end. And by font, I mean not only Genesis, but font as in, as in, as in a, a, a script font, a, a kind of common way of being, a common way of belonging together. So our common fonts, both our origin and our mode, our tropos of life, our mode of life, but also the desired end. That's, a, a, that's one I'd like to come back to. All right, and then over to, this is uh, on page 216, and I'm going to read a little bit more. I'm not going to say much here because this is, this is the rich passage, passage we might come back to. 216 to 217, these are sections 29 through 32. And while we're reading, Actually, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll 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 preface each one each one briefly. So twenty nine seems to me to be about the true being of all that true being, because if any any human is said to have true being, it is likely most palpably in those we refer to as saintly or saint like. <clears throat> and yet, look what Maximus says about the saints' um, accomplishments. All the achievements of the saints were clearly gifts of grace from God. None of the saints had the least thing other than the goodness granted to him by the Lord God, according to the measure of his gratitude and his love. This is normal. This is available to It's open to all. The invitation is open to all. And what he acquired, he acquired only insofar as he surrendered himself to the Lord who bestowed it. The saints have drawn near or have been drawn near already. This is Maximus beginning to relate images of the divine drawing us near, just as the divine draws near those of us who um, are palpably holy saints. Look at 30. <clears throat> and this introduces um, language of erotic union 
which I want to read out because it's um it's startling, but, but it's the song at the heart of the uh, of the tradition. When a man's intellect, when a man's noose is preeminent in virtue and spiritual knowledge, and he is determined to keep his soul free from evil slavery to the passions, that state, Maximus links later with the, with the kingdom, but continuing. When a man's intellect is preeminent in virtue and spiritual knowledge, and he is determined to keep his soul free from evil slavery to the passions, he says, Women are extremely strong, but truth conquers all. By women, he means the divinizing virtues, which give rise to that love that unites men with God and with each other, right? So almost woman becomes a kind of aphorism for virtue here. We know virtue through woman, just as we know God through virtue in a way, in a way. This love rests the soul away from all that is subject to generation and decay, to generation and decay, and from all intelligible beings that are beyond generation and decay. Okay, this love, um, which we acquire through this metaphor of woman. And insofar as this can happen to human nature, it intermingles the soul with God himself in a kind of erotic union mystically establishing a single shared life, undefiled and divine. By truth is meant the sole and unique cause, origin, kingdom, power and glory of created beings, from which and through which all things were made and are being made, by which and through which the being of all things is sustained, and to which the lovers of God dedicate all their diligence, there's that word again, diligence, and activity. Now, this is truth is Christ, clearly not truth is abstraction. So we have very, very sensual even and, and concrete imagery here. But moving on to 31. Women signify the supreme realization of the virtues, which is love, right? Women signify love. Love is also God, is also Jesus Christ, but love is the unfailing pleasure and indivisible union of those who participate through their longing in what is good by nature. Okay, that's fairly standard up to now. Truth signifies the fulfillment of all spiritual knowledge and of all the things that can be known. There's truth's eschatological dimension. For the natural activities of all created things are drawn by a certain universal intelligence to this truth, that's the drawing near, as their origin and fulfillment. For the origin and cause of created beings has as truth conquered all things naturally and drawn their activity to himself. And continuing on, especially with the imagery of Christ or with the, the, the notion of Christ as Aletheia, Christ as truth, who compasses and encompasses, who gives measure and offers the horizon. Because it transcends all things, truth admits of no plurality and reveals itself as single and unique. It embraces the spiritual potentialities of all that is intellective and intelligible since it transcends both intellective and intelligible beings. And by an infinite power, it encompasses both the ultimate origin and the ultimate consummation of created beings and draws the entire activity of each to itself. That's the divine. It encompasses, i.e. gathers and gathers and draws the entire activity of all created beings to itself. On some, here are the gifts, on some it bestows lucid spiritual knowledge of the grace they have lost, what we were just talking about, on their own self-effort. And to others it grants, through an indescribable mode of perception and by means of participation, an indescribable mode of perception by apophatic knowing and by means of participation, partaking, clear understanding of the goodness for which they long. Right. This is truth as Christ again. 
Now, <clears throat> turn to 36. We're just going to kind of hold that there because those passages are long and they're complex. And we can come back to these rich metaphors as we please in this way of delineating truth. But for now, 36. <clears throat> And this, this gathers a couple of our, of, our, of our strings so far. He who aspires to divine, aspires to divine reality, willingly allows providence to lead him by principles of wisdom through the grace of deification. He who does not aspire is drawn by the just judgment of God and against his will, as it were, away from evil by various forms of discipline. The first, as a lover of God, that phrase right there, that's one of the places we're landing here. A lover of God, he who aspires to God and aspires for the grace of God to come down to him, is a lover of God, deified by providence. providence. The second, although a lover of matter, okay, love, that erotic union turned the other way, is held back, by, held, held back from perdition by God's judgment. For since God is goodness him itself, he heals those who desire it through the principles of wisdom and through various forms of discipline, cures those who are sluggish in virtue. Now, a few things here. The action of grace means that our aspiration is actually led or drawn. We are drawn near or led in our aspiration, not by our aspiration. That aspiration is what opens us up to God by grace. And then this language, which echoes throughout the tradition, uh, throughout Maximus too. And, um, and, and um, we can come back to this as well. Lover of God, the lover of God, the lover of God. We become lovers of God by the grace of, of <clears throat> theosis, by the grace of deification. We are granted that most intimate most intimate union there is and then the phrase god is goodness itself i want to pause here for a minute we know that goodness is not it's not really a category it's not really a thing it's more an attunement within the moments to seek or to draw forth or to partake of what is life-giving and alive and godlike or holy in that moment in other words goodness sounds an awful lot like a form of presence right? Because presence is what our presence, especially our appropriate presence, is what allows us to respond um, in life-giving ways, or our distractions what allows us to not respond in life-giving ways. So God is goodness itself. That goodness verges, I would say, on what we've come to understand as presence, because we know it's not a category of activity. All right. Presence, God as presence, goodness as presence. And look at 37. 37 to me contains some astonishing, uh, astonishing um, statements. Real faith is truth, okay, Tr truth, Christ, truth, which is all embracing, all sustaining, and free from all falsehood. This is faith as truth, free from all falsehood, free from all lies, from all deception, from all delusion, from all illusion, even false lights. Right? So faith is that truth, which is free from all falsehood. And then as Christ is also all embracing and all sustaining. A good conscience, back to Maximus, confers on us the power of love since it is not guilty of any transgression of the commandments. Well, cast our minds back. We have understood or begun to understand the conscience as that faculty within us which will not admit lies, that faculty within us which will not admit lies. It's not, again, an arbiter in categories of this is a good act, this is an evil act, this is a good act, this is an evil act. We've seen that overturn more than once in Maximus. A good conscience will not admit lies. 
without lies, we are actually capable of loving. We are actually capable, maybe, of loving. That's the first statement, that lying is over against loving. But the second, since it is not guilty of any transgression of the commandments, well, this seems to imply that without lies, without that deception, we do not transgress. Without giving ourselves over to a false image, self-created, self-generated or not, self-conceived or not, transgression isn't really on our plates anymore. It's only when we, when we lie, when we fantasize, when we begin to believe our own images or illusions that we go astray. And so that's a, I don't know if that, I don't know if that's there, but it seems to me to be there. And if it's there, then that seems to me to be profound. Without lies, we do not transgress. All right. This is a statement not only about us, but also about the world. So let's turn over to 40. It's just over the page, uh, just uh, across the page, I mean, 219, 40. Although, first, <clears throat> let's look at... Um, Let's look at the last line of 39. As if from a spring welling up in our heart, the truth which resides in all things. That, that's the, that's the, 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 the line. The truth which resides in all things. Remember, transgression is just lying. There's no natural transgression. Right? Transgression is deception. All right. We ascend the 40, this is aphorism 40. We ascend step by step from what is remotest from God, but near to us, to the primal realities, which are furthest <clears throat> from us, but near to God. Okay. We ascend step by step from, from what is remotest from God, but near to us, to the primal realities, which are furthest from us, but near to God. Yeah, let me pause here for a second. So the truth which resides in all things, the truth which resides in all things. And then, so truth is everywhere, everywhere present and fillest all things. The Holy Spirit is everywhere present and fillest all things. The truth which resides in all things. We ascend step by step from what is remotest from God, but near to us, to the primal realities which are furthest from us, but near to God. This seemed to suggest that we are... What is remotest from God is lies and deception and delusion. And that's nearest to us when we're struggling, right? So it's not about that our, our, our concrete situation or the person in front of us or our, that, that we're not, you know, in a monastery. Any ordinary scene will do. That's not what, what is remotest from God. So we've confused and we need to reorient our sense of what is properly near, what is properly near to us, or what is properly close to our hearts, or maybe most intimate. What is near to us, we think is most pressing. And what is most pressing are often experiences we, we, we uh, struggle to shake, right? What is close to our hearts are our own favored conceits, our own images. I know they're closest to my heart anyways. The images that I make of life that I love, and I think, hey, there's something neat there, right? But this also ruins our intimacy, our intimacy with, with, with each other on the personal level now, intimacy. But also that intimacy, which we've just seen, is the image of union with God. Via Maximus's metaphors on, um, in um, 30 and 31 and 32, right? that erotic union. So we confuse what's nearby. We confuse what's close. We confuse what is intimate. That's all there in the first two lines, I think. Moving on, <clears throat> pardon me. Actually go move down to the, the last four lines on, on the page, this aphorism, because Maximus takes us through some ascetic movements to come to a place of understanding, but it's what he says about that place of understanding, which is possible, which is nearest to God and closest to God, although we don't know it 
This is the primal reality. From this, we advance to the simple and undistorted theory, the simple and undistorted participation and perception of the truth that is in all things. There's that phrase again, the truth that is in all things. From this point of vantage, as a result of our wise contemplation of sensible and noetic beings, we will, be, we will be enabled enabled to speak about the truth as we should. Only a few further notes here. <clears throat> the simple and undistorted theoria, participation, perception of the truth that is in all things. I find it remarkable that Maximus repeats nearly verbatim a phrase which is which is unusual and yet and yet deeply moving but then the last plan we will be enabled to speak about the truth as we should this about this is a different bigger question i want to ask david go about it later what's the difference between speaking about the truth right or apologetics as you call it and speaking within or speaking of or speaking in light of the truth, right? Speaking with truth. That's another question. The main thing I want to draw out of here, the truth which resides in all things, the truth that is in all things, and our movement. Our movement seems spatial, but it's just to recover what is most intimate and what is most nearby and what is most what is closest to our hearts. <clears throat> following this, following this, this um this idea of the truth which resides in all things. Turn to, uh, to 46, please. For, this is on 221, page 221. And, just see here. <clears throat> yeah, I'll read it out. No one can plead the weakness of the flesh as an excuse when he sins. For the union of our humanity with the divine logos through the incarnation has renewed the whole of nature by lifting the curse. And so we have no excuse if our will remains attached to the passions. It's just pause there for a second. No one can plead the weakness of the flesh as an excuse when he sins. For the union of our humanity with the divine logos through the incarnation has renewed the whole of nature, the whole of nature by lifting the curse curse of the lie of deception and so we have no excuse if our will remains attached to the passions this seems a little bit a little bit much in a way if you read it in a certain kind of way right kind of uh, well there's no you know there's no no way out no compassion but think of it another way too think of it in the terms that the flesh we can't just damn the flesh the flesh is blessed too the flesh is blessed too okay and not only that our will, our will need not be passionate, need not stray. For Christ's activity is precisely to remove necessity from our spiritual life. We are no longer subject to etc. 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 The freedom of Christ is the freedom from natural necessity. In other words, the freedom from fear of death. We're getting to that later on. I think that's tremendous. And then, and then this beautiful, beautiful just image. For the union of our humanity with the divine logos through the incarnation has renewed the whole of nature, the whole of nature, the whole of nature. Creation is blessed, it's not fallen in the sense of our downfall. It's blessed. On to the last line. For the divinity of the logos, which always dwells in grace, Pardon me. For the divinity of the Logos, which always dwells by grace in those who believe in him, withers the rule of sin in the flesh. That, that, that seems almost lightly put. The divinity of the Logos, which always dwells by grace in those who believe in him. But he's saying something supreme there. God indwells, really, and in everything that we're reading here, the reality of God, Maximus is saying, indwells through our belief right not one-sided belief of course now that indwelling what does that do that indwelling well 
look on 54 and 55. This is just over the page to, uh, to, to, to page 223. Now I'll read the whole of 54 and, and, then, and, then we'll, and, then, and then we'll read the whole of 55. The incense of power and desire on the other hand. So everything is leading to and from, to and from the images of the unoriginate kingdom. So keep that in mind. We're not examining right now his, his insights about the incense of power and desire. The incense of power and desire, on the other hand, are to be treated like the servant and handmaid of another tribe. The, contempt of, the contemplative intellect, through fortitude and self-restraint, subjugates them forever to the lordship of the intelligence, of the logikos in us, so that they serve the virtues, the virtues, aphorism of God. It does not give them their complete freedom until the law of nature is totally swallowed up by the law of the spirit. In the same way as the death of the unhappy flesh is swallowed up by infinite life. And until the entire image of the unoriginate kingdom is clearly revealed, mimetically manifesting in itself the entire form of the archetype. Well, that's astonishing language. Continuing, when the contemplative intellect enters this state, it gives the incense of power and desire their freedom, transmuting desire into the unsullied pleasure and pure enravishment of an intense love for God, as that erotic language again, and the incense of power into spiritual fervor, an ever active fiery elan, a self-possessed friendly frenzy. Hmm. No. Just pause for one second. Pardon me. The most important thing here is that Maximus points to a process of spiritual struggle and says the result of that struggle is, and then this amazing, this amazing um, phrase, is the entire image of the unoriginate kingdom is clearly revealed mimetically manifesting in itself the entire form of the archetype. Remember those words entire, right? The entire image, the entire form of the archetype. So that's the kingdom as a telos or as an end, right? It arises from the holiness of desire and fervor. Now look at 55. The intellect's unwavering concentration on spiritual knowledge and the incorruption of the senses when hallowed by virtue constitute an image of the unoriginate kingdom. Hmm. This occurs when soul and body through the spiritual transmutation of the senses into the intellect are united with each other solely by the divine law of the spirit. Back to the first sentence. The intellect's unwavering concentration on spiritual knowledge and the incorruption of the senses when hallowed by virtue constitute an image of the unoriginate kingdom. Now, this is a, this is a, a sense of kingdom as, as movement, kingdom as concentration, kingdom as the, the, the merging of concentration and hallowed being, right? Hallowed being, the senses hallowed by virtue. This is an image of the kingdom that is alive, that, 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 that's moving, that's vibrant. It's not the result in the same way. Hmm. So we have to be careful. These are not categories of meaning. Again. And then the last, the last sentence. In this state, the ever active vital energy of the Lord always pervades them and all unlikeness to the divine utterly vanishes. So in this in this state of, 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 of concentrated activity, prayer, right? Because concentration and attentiveness and prayer are very close ideas in, in, in for us in, and in Greek. Yeah. But the ever active vital energy of the logos always pervades them. We remember our ever moving repose, which was the image of the kingdom when we began, right? It's an, it, that echoes in this phrase too, in this idea that what unites both 
kingdom as end and kingdom as mo uh, movements is the ever active vital energy of the logos is the spirit of christ okay? the creative spirit of christ <clears throat> Let's turn to 57. It's just over the page. Just to, 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 to deep, deepen a little bit more this idea of without, transgre without lies, there is no transgression and the truth which resides in all things and the goodness of all being in life. So look at some 57 here. Evil has a beginning. For it has its origin in activity on our part, which is contrary to nature. So evil's beginning is our own activity in accordance with the passions, in accordance with the lies we've told ourselves about nature. But goodness does not have a beginning, for it exists by nature before time and before all ages. Goodness is intelligible because it can be grasped by intellection by the movement of the mind. Evil is not intelligible because it cannot be grasped by intellection. There's no reality. Intellection needs, remember, a being, an intellected being. There's no reality to evil. Goodness can be spoken about. Indeed, it is the only thing we should speak about. <laughs> Isn't that a perfect sentence? Goodness can be spoken about. Indeed, it is the only thing we should speak about. It also comes into being. It is, in fact, the only thing that should come into being. That's beautiful, too. For although by nature it is uncreated, yet because of God's love for us, it allows itself to come into being through us by grace, so that we who create and speak may be deified. Evil, which is the only thing that should not come into being. I love that sentence, too. Evil is the only thing, the only thing that should not come into being. Evil we cannot create. Evil is corruptible because corruption is the nature of evil, which does not possess any true existence whatsoever. Evil does not possess any true existence whatsoever. Goodness is incorruptible because it exists eternally and never ceases to be and watches over everything in which it dwells. Goodness, then, is what we should seek with our intelligence, long for with our desire, and keep inviolate with our sense of power. With our cognitive insight, we should prevent it from becoming adulterated by anything that is contrary to us. That's the work of the mind, what we're doing. With our voice, we should make it manifest in speech to those who are ignorant of it. That's the work of liturgy, yeah? And with our generative power, we should make it increase, or to put it more accurate, accurately, we should be increased by it. That's the creative life. Now, so evil's origin is in our action. Goodness is the only thing that we, that we should speak about and the only thing that should come into being. Evil is the only thing that should not come into being. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. And then the whole idea of striving to increase goodness or be increased by goodness, I find uh, lovely as a, as, a, as a kind of centralized spiritual task. Now, moving on to 60, <clears throat> 60 and 61. This brings us, brings us back to wisdom, brings us back to limitation and to love and to desire and to the gift, <clears throat> the gift of God beyond, beyond our own conditions. The origin and consummation of every man's salvation, every person's salvation, every human being's salvation is wisdom. Wisdom, the origin and consummation, Sophia, which initially produces fear, but when perfected, hold that word in mind, perfected, gives rise to loving desire, or rather, initially and providentially, initially and providentially, wisdom manifests itself for our sake as fear, 
so as to make us who aspire to wisdom desist from evil. But ultimately, it exists in its natural state for its own sake as loving desire, so as to fill with spiritual mirth, isn't great spiritual mirth, mirth, those who have abandoned all existing things in order to dwell with it. Wisdom brings mirth. Moving on to 61. To those who do not long for it, wisdom is fear because of the loss which they suffer through their flight from it. But in those who cleave to it, wisdom is loving desire, promoting an inner state of joyous activity. For wisdom creates fear, delivering a person from the passions by making him apprehensive of punishments. And it also produces loving desire, accustoming the intellect through the acquisition of the virtues to behold the blessings held in store for us. The blessings held in store for us is Maximus's phrase for the future kingdom, for the heavenly kingdom, the blessings held in store. That's his description. So wisdom, which we understand is commonly about death or about finitude, about the knowledge, the, the observation and knowledge of conditions, right? We're wise when we accept, when we, when we uh, accept our mortality or accept our limitations. What have you. It's commonly about death and limitation. And this form, Maximus says, produces fear, particularly if we do not love death and limitation, which we don't. Yet since Christ has overcome death, right? Christ, the wisdom of life, Christ has overcome death. Wisdom no longer points primarily towards that condition which has been overcome. It points towards the loving desire which draws us near or through which we are drawn near to the true countenance, the true face of, of, of Sophia or wisdom, which is Christ, the ancient of days. We move from fear to loving desire. That's the, that's the progression I want to know. That loving desire we've been talking about the whole time today. And that's, David, you might go, you might know. There's a saint who is one of the desert fathers. Others might know too, pardon me. Who says, I used to love, I used to fear God, but now I love him. You know, that's the, that's the, the grace granted at the end of a life. One of the saints has said that my whole life I have feared God. Only now am I beginning to love him. Okay, to wrap up, 94. This is just to play with, this is on page 233. Three. To play with the, with, with, with the words perfect and entire. Um, remember we saw the entire image of the entire kingdom and perfect wisdom and so on. 94. A perfect man, a perfect person, is one who by means of self-control fights against temptations subject to his will and who endures with patience trials that are contrary to his wishes. In other words, perfection is a steadiness of stance, a steadiness of countenance, a strength of disposition, perfection. An entire man, an entire man, or no, and, this is important, and, and an entire man is one whose practice of the virtues is completed by spiritual knowledge and whose contemplation does not remain without practical effect. So entireness here, the, the idea of entire seems to be of a whole spirit or of an integrity. And I thought, well, fair enough. That gives us some insight into the idea of the entire image um, of the unoriginated kingdom. And entire, you know, entireness here points to an integrity, an integrity of ascesis and noesis, right? And integrity is a fairly healthy way that we've been understanding entireness or wholeness or eschatology, right? It's a fairly good way. So that kind of helps us in our, in our, in our sense of trying to understand what eschatology means. But I thought, why does he do this? Why, why? And so... Maybe we're taught something about emphasis. Emphasis. I don't know why one would distinguish like this unless one wanted to think, okay, now maybe it's time to emphasize the perfection in our neighbor, right? Their steadiness, their endurance. Or maybe now it's time to emphasize the entirety of that person's nature as given by God, the integrity 
that they've been given, right? In other words, it's a lesson in encounter, a lesson in encounter. And what is good in encounter, and we thought about this earlier, what is good in encounter arises from presence. So my last note is the good partakes of presence. Hmm. And that's that's really where I, where I where I want to open it up. We might we might even start here with these words perfect and, and entire. We have ways back into not only a lot of what I just went over, but a lot of what else is in this um in this passage. Should one of you or we wish to to shift our focus slightly? Why this contrast? That's one question. It's an oddly serene kind of little passage in the middle. He's not, he's just saying two blessed things about two blessed states. <coughs> oh, pardon me, let me, let me, let me breathe a little. David, maybe I'll turn to you because I've looked at you a number of times and with with this idea of perfection or or entire entireness entirety or the language of true being true being we could turn back there or the human person as the lover of god or god as the lover of the human person what do you hear echoing here immediately if i may put you on the spot pardon me well it's you know, I, I pondered this, this connection and this distinction he makes between the perfect person and the entire person. And I think this is something that Maximus uh, <coughs> spent a lot of time on because monastics are full of you know, because monasteries are the insane asylum of the church. They're full of people who are virtuous and who, who have, who end up with enormous struggles around spiritual pride, mm -hmm. what that can mean. So I thought of a, I thought of a Hasidic story. It's a story about, um, Rabbi Dov, who was one of the, I think he was the grandson of the Bel Shem Tov, the master of the good name. Can't quite remember. It's a long time since I ran across it, but it, it stuck in my mind in connection with this. So Rabbi Dov was at the services in the shetel in his little, little synagogue. It was the afternoon service for uh, Passover. And he went to the service and Rabbi Dove was a teacher of children and he was much lauded as a teacher of children, but often as happens, not only in the ancient world, but also in ours, teachers of young children are lauded, but um, starved to death. So he was, uh, he did his work and he loved his work and he loved the children and uh, and he was slowly kind of starved to death. But this was the Passover. So he was at the afternoon service and it became dark and the service came to an end and uh, people were leaving and he didn't want to leave because he knew that if he walked out through the village with everybody else, they would see at his house that there were no candles in the window. And so they would immediately think, well, what's the matter? Um, and he didn't want to, you know, he was a man that had his pride. He didn't want to admit that he was, they didn't have any money for candles. They, they, didn't, they didn't have the wherewithal to have the Passover feast. So he waited and waited and waited and finally everybody had left. And so then he slowly walks home himself through the night and it's a lovely night, the stars are bright and he's not particularly preoccupied with the fact that they don't have anything for the feast, but 
And then he turns the corner and he sees his own house and he knows his wife is there. And, and to his astonishment, there are candles in every window. So he walks towards it, wondering what has happened. And, and he sees this carriage, a lovely carriage sitting there with the horses, beautiful horses, gently munching on some straw. So he goes in and there's a stranger in the house and the house is full of candlelight. The, um, the Pesach table is set. He can smell food cooking. So they haven't eaten for a few days. I mean, they really were starving. So he, he doesn't introduce himself to the stranger. He, he just goes immediately to the table and begins with his wife and the stranger, the Seder service, the household liturgy. And he does uh, the liturgy. It takes, of course, an hour and a half or so. It takes a while. And as soon as he's finished, uh, uh, the, the, the meal is put on the table and it's, it's wonderful and it smells so good and he's so hungry that he still doesn't turn to the stranger and ask the stranger who he is, but he proceeds to eat. And then of course, as you know, that meal divides the Seder service. And so as soon as he's finished, he moves into the second part of the Seder service. And only when he's finished that, does he turn to the stranger and, and ask him who he is. And the stranger is a little apologetic, and he said that he's the steward uh, for an estate that is a few kilometers from the village, the estate of a very wealthy man, and that over the years he had heard about Rabbi Dov, and he had heard about his depths, the depth of his spiritual life, and so he had thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could have the Seder with Rabbi Dov? So he prepared everything and brought it in hopes he could have the Seder with him. And Rabbi Dov expresses his gratitude. This is wonderful that you've done this. We're so grateful, but he's a Jew after all. So he says, but we can't repay you. We have nothing to give you. And the man said, oh, well, you are a friend of Adonai. And I've heard stories told about this. Everybody knows that you're a friend of Adonai and that Adonai will, will grant you everything you ask. My wife and I have wanted a child and we have not been able to have a child. Could you ask Adonai to give us a child? Rabbi Dove says, oh, this year, this coming year, a year from now, you will have a child. I will talk to Adonai, you will have a child. The man rejoices and they talk a little bit longer and then he goes on his way. And Rabbi Dove and his wife go to bed, go to sleep. And at three o'clock in the morning, his wife wakes up. She doesn't find him there. She goes downstairs, it's three o'clock in the morning. They've had this long service. <laughs> What's going on? And here she finds him dancing in ecstasy around the table, laden with all of the the dishes and leftovers from the Seder. And he's in a complete state of ecstasy, joy before the throne of God's grace. She tries to get his attention and can't. Finally, she calls him by his Yiddish name and that brings him down to earth. And he, uh, she says to him, why are you why are you doing this? It's three o'clock in the morning. What, what has gotten into you? 
And he said, oh, I had a wonderful dream. I dreamt that Adonai, no, no, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Adonai came to me in my dream and said, Rabbi Dove, do you know what you did tonight? You know why Adonai did not grant this man and this woman a child? Let me tell you what this man did many years ago, which made Adonai decide that this man would not be a father. So he told him. And then he said to Rabbi Dove, but you know, Adonai loves you and can never refuse you. So because you spoke and because you promised, Adonai will grant them the child. But there is a cost. You, Rabbi Dove, will not enter paradise. And his wife listens to this and looks at him and says, and for this, you dance in ecstasy? What are you doing? This is the worst possible thing. And Rabbi Dove says, all my life, I have lived the whole of the law. All of my life, I have done my best with the children, with other people in the neighborhood. I've done everything, everything in hopes that I would win eternal life. And now I know I can simply do everything for my love of God. So I, I, I see in this, I don't know that I'm right about this. That that the the desire for doing things perfectly, you know, if that story carries anything in it, often has within it a, if not a secret wish, or at least it can appear to be, that wish to be on the right side of things, to win the torch, to enter the kingdom. But the kingdom is in it always elsewhere. And uh, the entire man, the one completed by spiritual knowledge, the contemplation itself also is practical. Is when that is no longer there, when we are freed even Finally, of that, what seems like such a such a good and holy hope, we are freed simply to enter into the joy of what is given.
until perfection. And it's an odd formulation on his part because as, as, as we know from so many of, of the patristics, they, they speak of perfection in terms of self-control, in terms of temptations, in terms of the will, in terms of enduring trials. And I mean, that's a really significant thing. I, I'm not taking anything away from this. But in the end, they also speak of the ways of imperfection. You know, they also speak of that, that that perfection in the end isn't, you know, the most we can say that that, that struggle for perfection is a, is a ladder. Um, it's there to try and ensure that we're capable when the fullness of grace, grace addresses us, we're capable of opening to it. But in and of itself, it isn't the point. So. Beautiful. I, I'm sorry, I have to run for something for this wedding week, but. David, what a beautiful story. That is a beautiful story. And that perfection is necessary but insufficient to, yeah. to becoming entire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Bless your children. Thank you. And, uh, and you know, just reflecting on it very quickly, I mean, it does give that story is a completely different way of, of hearing Moses yeah. being denied the promised land. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. I've got, I've got some thoughts on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry I have to run, but thank you so much, Richard, uh, for, for this rich time. Andrew, thank you for your your leadership again. Uh, wonderful. Have a, and we'll see uh, you in two weeks. Wedding goes well. Ciao, David. Will do. Ciao. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. I like that I think, contrast. I think Lorraine, Lorraine, were you wishing to? Speak? No, I'm. No, I'm good at the moment. I'm just thinking about what you just said. So I thought your hand went up in the air. I did it. Was I don't a, know. Was that a was that a kind of signal, or a, or was it a blessing? <laughs> <laughs> David, if you could, if you could. Put it again. What would you say that is being healed in that in in the story you told, or in the um, what is the, being healed? What is being healed? Right? Is it an illusion? Is it is it a is it an idol? Is it um, is it misplaced energy? <clears throat> because I mean, it's such a lovely, and I love that, that that Jennings brought in Moses as well. Because of course, it's I mean, of course, right? <clears throat> but 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 that shift from from what we thought was the point, right? Yeah. And we've convinced ourselves was the point to what is it? And and this is I mean, I like both of these very much because it's exactly what we're talking about. It's not. It's not something really nice versus something really awful, and we might choose the really awful one. Oh, it's good. It's discern, yeah. It's discerning exactly, which is why the category of good is not static, because it can't be. That's why we were thinking of goodness in other ways before. But I, I very much like that, <laughs> that 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 insight you're getting to. How, how would you, if you could, if you could just put put it um, affirmatively or just just in 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 a way, you know? Well, I would say that 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 story is about, about the mind of Rabbi Dove, who in his own mind, given his own wonderful way of being in the world, there still remained a sense of dualism, mm. a sense that the kingdom was somehow something that he could maybe earn or could maybe come to at some time. And it was the healing of that 
and knowing that it was there now. It was there in his blessing of that man and woman. Um, and that his fear that maybe he wouldn't do enough to inherit the kingdom didn't mean anything. But that fear was finally healed. It's healed by the Annunciation. Of course, you've given up the kingdom because you stormed heaven. And that's because the kingdom isn't there. It's here. Around the Maximus table, says the around fear the turned table, into dirty dishes. Yeah. And the, the fact the that fear you, turned into loving desire. Yeah. Hmm. And I think that that fissure in human consciousness among the best people. Hmm. You know, among the best people. Hmm. Is in a sense the the final thing that needs to be healed. with a final appetite that needs to be shown to not taste nearly as good as what you have already. David, is this the same trap that people fall into in terms of either romanticizing the future or the past, right? Where you kind of get this um, forward focusing, or I would actually, say, I've, I've seen it more in the Roman Catholic Church, just kind of romanticizing the past, right? Like this nostalgia for something that isn't real and losing sight of what actually is occurring like here. Sorry, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, you know, I often hear this kind of, you know, oh, the good, like for lack of a better way, like the good old days, you know, where God was present to us, but now not so much, you know, and, and so it creates this kind of distortion of, um, like, I don't know how that holds up with the scriptural idea that, you know, the kingdom of God is here. Right. So if it's here, it's now. It's not something that's occurred previously. So I'm just wondering if did those link together then in some way, I think. Yeah, though I think I think in the story, it's I think it's the final frontier in human consciousness of that little niggle. Um Whereas in sort of collective nostalgia or collective idealization, I think that's a, in a sense, that's a, it's a more gross form of the same problem. Uh, but bo both of them point to the the struggle for us human beings because of the nature of our mind. You know, we have this wonderful ability to remember and we have this wonderful ability to imagine. And so there are great temptations in nostalgia and in utopian dreaming. And both of them pull us out of presence. And uh, I mean, is one of the things that I find so uh, moving about, about the Christian revelation is this way in which it holds together the notion of the presence of the kingdom. Jesus said, it is within you, it is between us, it is here now. And the notion of the fullness of the kingdom, it's coming to greet us. So the problem with with the tension that's held there by the, the way the church holds together, and, and so does Judaism, 
a notion of the presence and the fullness, it holds those together, is, is the tradition's way of saying, presence isn't an idealization. It's, it's actual, it's what is, mm. it's what is. Mm. But what is, is not frozen by the moment or frozen by what we presume about it. It's also coming to be. So it's deeply dynamic. It's called the unfolding of the spirit. So does that speak to it at all? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think it, it does speak to it. Um, Because I think without that focus on the presence, presence, then it is very easy to get into an, an idealized state, right? Then we we lose what is in front of us, which is I think what Maximus is trying to say. We of course can presume about presence we can think the presence is our feelings about it. But what Maximus is driving at, I think here, is that, you know, when we, there is no presence where there isn't integrity. Mm. But integrity isn't something we have. Maybe Andrew would like to argue with this or Michael. Seems to me integrity is also something that unfolds in communion, in relationship. We discover our integrity. Integrity for me is always in the act of integration, just like you're saying, it's an ongoing, it's, it's an never a state. Right. And it's an act of integration in communion with others. Exactly. Well, that's really beautiful put, David. Especially, I like how you how you both parsed and then drew together <clears throat> that the, the 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 distinct truths of the images that um, Lorraine you were offering, and then David, your story was offering. That that moment of clarity or light is is I like how you how you how you linked it and yet and yet distinguished. And you're right that 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 moment in the story is that imperceptible movement, which almost isn't even a movement, but it's just it's almost imperceptible. But it's the most important, the final frontier, as you called it, and then drawing it back into presence and fullness in that way, the dynamic way in which that's in which those 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 um, those principles correspond. Hmm. Um, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you, David, about uh, to, to look at a passage um, passage or two, because particularly, well, just to begin us um, back in the text for a moment. What do you make of 46, David? 46, this uh, page 221. Page two to one. It's the uh, it's the um, it's the one in which Maximus says Christ has renewed the whole of nature, and he seems to remove any compassionate condition understood to erring. I mean, I began to scratch it, but if you will take us, uh, take us. Uh, Another, another remove in. <clears throat> Let's read it again. Huh? Mm -hmm. No one can plead 
the weakness of the flesh as an ex excuse for his sins. <laughs> so, I mean, he's talking to monks here. He's talking to people that know the story. Mm -hmm. He's talking to people that go to the liturgy, go to confession regularly, are subject to those disciplines. That's who he's talking to. No one can plead the weakness of the flesh as an excuse when he sins. For the union of our humanity with the divine Logos through the incarnation has renewed the whole of nature by lifting the curse. And so we have no excuse if our will remains attached to the passions. For the divinity of the Logos, which always dwells by grace in those who believe in him. And I love this word, withers the rule of sin in the flesh. So, I mean, this sounds like, <laughs> you know, this sounds like, oh my God, I don't have any excuses. You know, I mean, really give me a break. But for monastics who are, whose whole life has been oriented around you know, prayer and work and study and and where they're involved in going to confession regularly and what have you. I mean, this is a kind of challenge to them. Probably a challenge associated with maybe a kind of spiritual lethargy or something. I mean, the theological, the implicit kind of theological statement, yeah, sure. But, you know, it's not good enough for that to be a kind of theological statement. It's got to, it's got to do something. It's got to unveil our spiritual life in some fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... So, I mean, I believe in the divinity of the Logos. Yeah, of course I do. And that grace is there, but, you know, the rule of sin doesn't wither. So I think it's a, I suppose it's a call huh? to uh, to to wake up to the fact that one still often, I mean, none of you do, of course, I know that, but that this notion of the weakness of the flesh, this notion of the fact that we still hang onto our passions that um, our life is still bound and ordered around that which may, misses the mark. You know, the It's a kind of distillation of the teaching about that. And I think at best, it's a kind of call to, mm -hmm. you know, you can, don't make it so easy for yourself with these excuses. You know, we say in the liturgy, excuses with excuses in sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, a charming line in the liturgy. 
uh, our humanity, our nature. Our nature is one with the Logos. And it is that despite this, but we don't know it. And the spiritual path is to come to the place where not only is that, but you know it and you're at peace with it and you live in it. And in some sense, you live out of it. You mentioned 40 as well, this issue of truth, which resides yeah, let's, in yeah, let's, all uh, things. And you spoke yeah. about whether this was, how was it? Let me just look. Um, <clears throat> you spoke a little bit about the need to reorient to what is properly near yeah, just the first three lines of 40. Yeah, not our conceits. The one thing that struck me is you spoke about truth as within it or of it. My sense is that what's being pointed to here is that that when we are in communion, we live out of the truth. It's not abstract. It's not something we, we claim or, or we can touch, but it's, it's a way of being, which is, and I think you said this, I mean, it's, truth is our, It is that experience of, of communion where there is only integrity. Hmm. Hmm. Not perfection, integrity. And that distinction made earlier is yeah. exactly what's needed here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And truth, not as a concept. No, no, no. And certainly not beliefs. But it is a... I mean, in the last line where he says, from this point of vantage, as a result of our wise contemplation of sensible and noetic beings, we will be enabled to speak about the truth as we should. Well, that will always be a word of gratitude, a word mm. that enlightens a word that turns enmity to empathy, a word that heals, a word of communion. And if it isn't that kind of word, it's not the truth. It may be a truth, but it's something that's not being lived out What do you make of it, Michael? You know a lot more about truth than I do. So. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I um, had an interesting conversation about a week ago at a celebratory gathering in a small prairie town with a, um, a monk who, who seemed um, from afar to be slightly uh, at times distant and not present. And yet um, I had a conversation which touched on this um, issue of 
truth. And he acquainted me with a, a few icons um, on his um, little device, his phone that I had never um, encountered before. It's probably a, quite a familiar motif for um, people in the um, Orthodox faith. And it reminded me of the sentence just before the one that you quoted at the end of the um, section 40, refer, referring, and that Andrew earlier referred to it in relation to goodness and presence and how um, truth is something which resides in all things. And so the striking um, icon that he showed me, and I, I can't remember, it was in response to some, something fatuous, which I had said, but it was a very polite way of suggesting a counter proposition um, through, um, and then he exemplified it through showing these images. And what the image showed was when um, Jesus went down into, it also reminded me of a conversation that you, you and I had on our last night in uh, the in the bar of the Grant Hotel, when you were talking about even, um, even we were talking about universalism and you threw out the astounding prospect of even um, say, Satan being someone who could, who was, who could out, one could hope would ultimately be redeemed. Anyways, the, the, the monk um, sh showed me these icons which showed, um, which were meant to exemplify the, the infinitude of um, divine grace and of truth. And so the icons show Jesus in hell and emanating from him everywhere, even in hell, this um, place as far removed from goodness as possible. Um, the divine still is infinitely um, pervasive. And that that is something that is probably um, necessary to bear in mind when um, thinking about, you know, the incense of passions and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's why in, in this, this whole um, century, I've been quite struck um, by the, I think from 54 to 56, the, those um, sections which, um, there's that striking passage that Andrew brought to our attention of the uh, kind of um, medic apprehension of the archetype. Um, anyways, and then it brought up um, um, a, an attitude which is quite striking. We, as, as we know, we've seen these reversals over and over again that um, illuminate a kind of easy understanding of um, things that Maximus seems to be intent on showing, then suddenly we have these reversals which really illuminate yeah. something. And so instead of um, the notion of um, just simply obliterating or canceling, which I think would be a, a, a very different religious tradition further to the East, there's, a, there's the, uh, he mentions in um, section 55 or 54, just quickly refresh my memory. He, he refers to the transmuting of, um, this is in section mm -hmm. 54. He, he, he refers to the trend under these, in this particular state of the transmuting of insensitive yeah. powers and desi desires, passions and desires rather. And then, and that's where, when he introduces this um, concept, which um, re reminds me of, um, so, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but it reminds me of um, a, um, a well-known German scholar of Dionysus in his um, work, Dionysus myth, myth and Cult, at one point in that extraordinary early 20th century work, Otto, Walter Otto refers to um, how sometimes Dionysus and Apollo would be worshiped at the same yeah, yeah. place and they would be they would merge into the same yeah. god and for me this is a kind of a groping toward monotheism in the what we like to disparage as pagan religions and so this notion of self-possessed frenzy that one 
finds oneself into. I take it that when you were telling the story, that's the image that which came to mind yeah. of dancing in this ecstasy. It's a, um, so it's not, it's not that um, some of the presumptions, the, some of the lingering presumptions, even in such a, an exemplary man as um, Rabbi Dov had, even these had been overcome, but yeah. not through a kind of, um, which would be a kind of death, a kind of um, obliteration of the passions, but a transmuting of the passions and attendant um, presumptions. And that is important to bear in mind because otherwise the metaphor of um, life <laughs> wouldn't mean anything and we would be embracing something closer to um, death. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder of, of uh, the book. I haven't thought of, I got that book, you know, I read it back in the 60s, but and I remember being, I mean, just listening to you speak about it, I remember how touched I was by that. So, yeah, that's fabulous. I, I haven't also re read it I, since my, um, well, a long time ago. <laughs> I won't say how many decades ago, but... <laughs> Your story, just um, also earlier, you know, the this I wasn't expecting to see. I, there, there, there always seemed to be <laughs> things in um, Maximus that I don't expect to see, and so so this idea of self-possessed frenzy, just the yeah. the term frenzy, and it kept on coming up in these uh, three sections, um, sort of threw me back to that that um, Walter Otto's um, comment yeah. is uh, convergence of Apollo and Dionysus. That's really great. That's really great. And this harkens back to what you were saying about the dynamic nature of, um, yeah. you know, this isn't a kind of a, I guess it's a gloss on the perfectionism. I'm, perfectionism is, of course, um, the perfection of finite beings and even the parameters by which they perceive themselves to be approaching or striving toward perfection are themselves finite and limited. And so that's another contrast with the, um, with a, a uh, what was the contrast again between perfection and um, not wholeness, but Entirety. Entirety, yes. David, you're a little bit muffled right now. Your, your microphone somehow. I am? Uh, that was clear. Now you're back. <clears throat> now you're back. What did, uh, what did we all make of 57? About the origin of evil. Or, or I mean, not about the, he, he's, he's giving accounts of the genesis of evil. Lorraine, Michael, David, what did you, what, uh, what did you think? I thought it was uh, kind of uh, sinuous and, and, and well done, this little section. But that's just a comment on form. What did you make of his definitions, Michael? Well, it, of, um... it, it, it strikes me just um, just just a uh, you know surface thought is uh, slightly paradoxical that um, e evil could have a beginning and it could be um, something that comes out of some, some of our activities, and yet it's also um, that which is has no being and is nothing. So that I think we're meant to. Um, grapple with a um, with our ordinary concept of being that's what I that's that's not making sense of the do you mean oh do you mean the definitions of, above um, oh in the previous section too there's a whole series of definitions of pleasure and desire and good and no sir I was thinking mainly in, in no you, you were right on right there okay. your, your musings on, on evil yeah 
Well, yeah, no, it's a, it's so what, a why definition that doesn't let you um, seize on um, anything. Why do you think he's doing that? Why um, is well, he, why I, is he I, I, I just evil in this way. Maybe by destabilizing our concept of being, that's another way of destabilizing some of our presumptions. I mean, this is. That's a tension of thought. Also, the notion that evil is is corruption. It's not something on in and of itself, but it's a corruption of something that is good. Uh -huh. Does this also then link back to the, was it 94? Sorry, I'm terrible with numbers. Um, where he's talking about, you know, we can't just blame the, the flesh. Like I, what stood out to me here is by stating that evil isn't a being, I, I think it almost ex, um, precludes an excusion, right? Like it, it's actually a nothingness versus, you know, being able to state, oh, well, I just did it because, it, you know, it was, it's evil or, Right? Like there's something about that that I think gives an element of excuse to it. Yeah. But by him flipping it around, he's really saying, no, we can't just, you, you can't just, technically evil is nothing, right? Like it has no being. So you can't, you can't give it this kind of, I don't know, persona, or, um, pers you know, personality. You can't, you can't give it its, its, its own kind of, yeah, being for lack of a better word, sorry. Uh, sort of a rambly thought, but there's something for me that links into that. So we we can't just use that as a way to kind of get around the problem because that's why he's saying, you know, we can only speak of good, right? I mean, on a very pastoral, practical level, he's he's stating something about, you know, we have to be careful, I think, about the language that we use and the, and the notions that we then portray. Um, in it, sorry, it's a kind of half big thought, but um, yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> keep going, keep going. That's beautiful. Keep going. <laughs> no, that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, to me, you're right there. It's an, um, kind of an encouraging um, thought or or because because it, it is um, it is easy to be filled with demoralizing um, thoughts. It, I mean the 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 um, what well-known um, um, proposition that came to mind was you know but not resisting um, evil in a sense mm -hmm. and and because I, I i think all all of us pr probably you know when we're in an imaginative full flight especially in in um in in sense of moments let's say of, of the non-transmuted sort can can become alive with um some of the most astonishing um the horrible um thoughts you know, almost demonic, um, grotesquely demonic thoughts of retribution and so forth. Sometimes under the, even under empathetic guise of a, of a justice. And the, I think these these are. I mean, the risk of personifying them. Perhaps they're just our projections. Um, the, these seem to be, you know, sort of demonic thoughts. Just take that. Um, metaphorically, but it's perhaps, but or perhaps not, because these are ultimately mysterious things. And and the thought that one um, can be infested with such thoughts, but not allow them to take possession of one, is an 
profoundly encouraging thought. And it's an important thought because if you think that this is, has infested you, that has become part of you, then then you're in a, um, a sad space. And you might be, you might be more inclined to uh, um, rationalize some of the, you know, um, indignant feelings of justice. I mean, we, Gary Saul Morrison made, made that point, Andrew, in this um, mm -hmm. essay that we were both um, reading recently about, you know, mm. it's easy, you know, reacting against, um, say, some horrible war of aggression to fall into um, a potentially ugly um, frame of mind for the for the most lovely and empathetic reasons. I'm prone to becoming topical. <laughs> well, that's so beautiful, Mike. <clears throat> that, <clears throat> pardon me. That's my response. And that idea that, that or, or your imagery, the, the, the imagery with which you point to a truth which you, which you feel, must feel deeply, to put it so well, that as it were, there can be snakes underfoot, but they don't necessarily interrupt prayer, you know? Yeah, there was that metaphor of snakes at one point, um... Well, I, I wasn't trying to quote, so I'm not yeah, sure so, sorry. What it was, but <laughs> but but that, that 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 idea that that it's not it's not about some kind of pure inventory, self inventory. The conscience is not about some yeah. kind of purity of look, self inventory. It's about being clear about what uh, I forget exactly how you put it, but but what you live by are kind of. It's not if it's there, but if it's if it's there as you, or, uh, you put it better than that. Pardon me. Pardon me. I mean, there's a, there's potentially a hypocritical aspect, and that was the uh, quote when you mentioned snakes. The uh, passage I can't remember which uh, number it is that came back when uh, Ma Maximus was talking about the twistings and turnings that are um, that seem to um, exemplify hypocrisy. Sixty-seven. That was the. I have a different sort of question. I'd like to open up. Um, it goes back to to what Lorraine was saying earlier, because I, I really liked how you were putting putting the the idea of of evil as Maximus articulates it in Aphorism fifty-seven. You know. And then, and then I also thought, so this was combined with, in an earlier passage David was reading, I wanted him to, I, I meant to ask him, and I forgot to ask him his thoughts on the idea of has lifted the curse, right? Christ has renewed the whole of nature by lifting the curse. So I thought curse, right? Evil in this sense is nothing. It's, 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 uh, it's illusion. It's, it's what have you. The main, the main figure for evil we have in the scriptures is personified, and it's a voice, and it's the voice of deception. So I wanted to, I thought to ask you, David, but I don't just want to, I don't want to disclude, but I thought to begin with you, maybe, how, what do you make of that, of both the need to be, to be quite firm, let's say, in articulation on the one hand, and yet, hold that together with the imagery of the tradition, which is very much embodied and, and, and put in the voice. If that makes sense. Well, if I've understood you. What is <laughs> I think it's part of natural religion. This is a dangerous thing to say, but I think it's part of natural religion. I think it's part of the habit of the human mind to understand that the world is cursed. 
to um, see the world as good and bad, as true and false, uh, to see to see the world in those dualistic terms. And um, because it's part of such a common way of understanding the world. I mean, in, in most, most religions and most many philosophies, uh, many ways of understanding the world and human experience, uh, we see life depicted as illusion or as trial, uh, something to be gotten over or through and out of to someplace else. Uh, even for somebody like a good Jew, like Rabbi Dov, to harbor that notion that there is some other place. And I think this is really, you know, I used to be unsympathetic to this, but I, I think I understand why people think this because because we're faced with suffering and um, you know, I have a, I have a sister who's, both of her daughters have just recently been diagnosed with pretty serious cancer. <clears throat> and I mean, she's always been, uh, you know, she's really thought, sought to be faithful to the church and, and all of that and her understanding of it. She's always been very suspicious of me because of my interest in theology and the church. Makes her uncomfortable. But you know, if, you, if, if your life has had in it these traumatic shocks and your belief system, and I use that deliberately here, your belief system doesn't it's essentially dualistic. It doesn't give you much, many ways to understand disappointment, to understand alienation, to understand suffering, to understand sorrow. Accept as oppositional. Accept as something that's wrong. And then you search for why it's wrong. And of course, the worst of that search is you blame yourself, which I think my sister has done all too often. Or you blame somebody else. And um, so, I mean, I think that way of seeing the world, seeing the world as somehow cursed is ubiquitous. And so Maximus saying, yeah, we see the world that way. Lots of monks see the world that way. Monasticism, after all, is the relief valve for Gnostic views. So a lot of monks are really Gnostics. They have a dualistic world. That's why they're preoccupied with demons. But what do they think those demons are? You know, and what is the curse? I think Maximus here is saying, look, the incarnation has changed the picture fundamentally. The world is not cursed. It is blessed. All of nature contains logismoi. All of nature is a manifestation of the word. So <clears throat> that's my take on it, Andrew. What's yours? 
That was beautiful. That was beautiful. I mean, one I needs to plumb to curse, that. You tend to curse a little bit more than I do. So, <laughs> you more insight into that. <laughs> I thought I didn't. I didn't make myself clear earlier. So just let me let me be a little bit clearer now. Pardon me. We were talking about about the evil of, of mistaken choices, say, yeah, right? the evil yeah. of mistaken choices. But then it sounds in another passage, lifted the curse as if uh, your interpretation is beyond this, but, but, but the crude interpretation is, you know, that it's kind of, there's a curse as in it's all wrong, just all wrong, right? But then also curse means, um, curse means a word spoken in malediction, in ill will. It means a damning word, right? Yeah, and that damning, Mm -hmm. pardon me the opposite of blessing right 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 exactly exactly right and creating and that damning word is the word of this this personified figure we often and 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 which is in the jewish imagery with which the bible begins and is in the imagery throughout the scriptures actually that there is um as it were um you know the great deceiver right? the angel of false light right? mm -hmm. Who speaks the the ill word, not the blessed word, the ill word against creation? So when deception rules creation, that's the word of the of the of the um, of the liar. evil, of, yeah. of the liar, right? Of the great deceiver, not of 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 not of the blessed one, mm -hmm. not of the anointed one, of Adonai. So that, that was the connection I thought to could make. You plumbed the, the idea of curse further than I did. You know more about, more about that, that, that sort of thing, you know, wonderfully. I was thinking more of the, of the, of the physical movement almost of it, mm. you know. The, and then I thought, so if it is the voice of the, you know, the great deceiver in the ear, that's kind of nice too, because it removes us from thinking that, that oh, it was a... It was a <laughs> Kind of when we think of, of mistaking something, that can be attached to conditions very easily. Very easily. But if we think of the act of mistaking being in the interruption of our concentration, that, that, that we have to ward against the interruption rather than not be mistaken, but we have to you know, be careful about interruption, that's a different way of thinking. That actually blends kind of nicely with what you were saying earlier, Michael, about being able to take a few kind of shots, as it were, and have those pellets lodged in you and yet not make them part of you, you know, to be able to have that. Hmm. That's all I got from it, just the, 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 the basic physical gesture of it. Is it time? Should it be I think time? It's time? Could be time. All right, pardon me. I'll pause the um, recording here.